In this lecture, we look into energy and industry. So industry is the, one of the main consumer of energy. And we will learn how this happens, what parts of the energy industry, what parts of the industry uses a lot of energy. And so another thing is that the production of goods is a constant growing thing in our industrialized society. We will see that the efficiency of producing goods gets better and better, but it's eaten up by the volume of products. And um, we really learn that China is a very dominant production place. That is at some point always really surprising how the impact of this country is. Now let's go into the details. The first thing is we ask about the efficiency in energy used in the country United Kingdom. Why do we look into the United Kingdom? Now the United Kingdom was the first industrialized country in the world and they have just good figures about their different demands. And so we look really far back 1800, so 200 years really at the beginning of a heavy industrialization. And now we look in a scale gigajoule um, per service level or per unit. Now a little bit depending on what we are looking in detail now. Now let's look. Um, how much gigajoules did you use need to heat something? And heating something is not so difficult, and so it is a process that was really well understood, uh, even 200 years. And so over the 200 years, the efficiency of heating has gotten better, but only about a factor of nine or ten depends. That is quite a lot, and it is something like if you have um, an open fire and you want to have a roast beef on that, uh, or if you do that on your gas stove uh, with a little bit more um, reflection of the heat and so on. So heat is really has gone down. So then we have the transport system that's blue. Now transportation in this modern industry starts with the railway. At the beginning the energy didn't go down. The reason was the trains got faster and uh, that heated up all the optimization in the steam engine but then there was a rapid period and so the transport the energy for a thousand passenger kilometers so again one of his units we have seen in another lecture it gone down about also more or less a factor of ten, maybe eight and there is one exception to this rule, and that is really amazing. That is light. So we can ask how much gigajoules you need for 10 to the power 6 lumen hours. Now, what's a 10 to the power 6 lumen hours? If you have an illuminated room, you have something like 10 to the power 5, and the 2 to the power 3, 1000 lumen hours is quite bright. And so that makes um, one year of lightning um, give for this 10 or 6 lumen hours, something like that. So, and now look back in the beginning of the 19th century, 200 years ago, you needed 100 gigajoules. So light was extremely expensive. Then it has gone down, and at the of a century 
there has been gas light and some other ways to illuminate rooms still not electric lights then 1900 the electric light started and it has gone down not too much because incandent uh, electric light from edison's incandent light is not very efficient but then came the light emission from uh, different gases and that is much more efficient and in the last years we have seen a conversion to leds again a strong reduction in the energy use so overall that period we see that light has could be optimized about a factor of 1000 that is really an amazing factor for a single application we can be sure that this will never happen again because now our leds are so efficient that they just use every electron for a photon and that is a physical limit so there will never happen another factor of 10 maybe a two or three but not 10 and it never a thousand if you average that overall the different demands you end up with this line and you see that the energy efficiency has grown by a factor of 10 that is a good value over 200 years now if you are more efficient then the service price goes down your cost of light or whatever you need is going down one thing is because you have a higher efficiency in your system and you have um, a cheaper electricity for example this combined reduces your costs the details are sometimes tricky because um, there may be some raw material getting expensive that was happening for example with lightning uh, during war times or something like that but the overall trend is that things get cheaper the only thing that didn't get too much cheaper is heating it's still expensive but yeah a factor of 10 was done other things like transport has gone even more than that more than a factor of 10 and so we see this in the unit us dollars per gigajoule of service level you know service level means what you really have from the energy not for energy uh, production itself now how do we source this energy energy sources at the beginning of the industrial age we're going back to 1850 were dominated by bi biomass that is wood wood burning was the main source of energy the disadvantage of this um, way to harvest wood is that some countries have no more trees on the surface so if you go to um, spain or italy or britain you don't find too much forests even here in the black forest you now find a lot of forest but be aware 150 years ago there was no more forest here in the black forest it was really completely cut down some new laws emerged and they um, rebounded that effect and so it was uh, re-established to have forests here especially at the top of the hills so now but 8050 another thing came in and that was the first big thing in energy production that is coal coal can be mined relatively simple and so the coal um, usage exploded more or less over this 
60 years, coal has gone from just from zero to half of all the energy of the world. And that was also for a period when new sources came in very slowly, but one of the sources, for it, one for oil, did it in an exponential way. And if something is exponentially growing, you always know there will come an end to the growth. That happened with oil in the 70s. There was a big oil crisis. And since that time, the part of energy that is coming from oil is going down. That does not imply that the absolute numbers are going down, but only the percentage of the oil within the mix of energy. And in the same way as the oil has gone down, a little bit uh, delayed, about uh, 25 years, came gas, and gas is still on the growing path. These are the big new players. Here you coal, you see it's going down. There is another steep, uh, small twiggle here. But the long-term trend of coal is going down. Really one long-term trend, although there are some divagations from that line. Other things like nuclear power didn't make it. They started also an exponential line here, but they failed to reach more than 10%. And um, hydropower here is a special thing because this is not a really true line. This line tells us only the hydropower that is used to produce electricity. Um, in the former days, we also used hydropower for mills and other stuff but not um, in electricity. So it is not shown in the scale here for whatever reasons. It's not my work, but they had it a little bit in a misleading form. Um, hydropower today is a constant thing. They build new um, hydro dams, but it's always eaten up by the growing demand. So the percentage of hydropower is always somewhere about 5% reason it doesn't drain enough, there are not enough rivers, and so there is no way to go in this high region. But what you learn over that period of time is that the different ways to produce, the ways to produce energy diverged. So we have a diverse view now, we have a lot of different ways to produce energy from oil, from gas, from hydro, nuclear, and Renewables, but they are still in the baby state. They have to grow. Now, what we now can look is how that is related to the GDP. So the GDP per gigajoule. This number we have had already um, something in a, in a first overview plot, but now let's look into GDP per gigajoule over time. And we start again with a country where we have a lot of data, and that's the United States. And they, of course, are a very rich country and using a lot of energy. They started here, 1800, with a low income, and be aware. People in the United States, even in this today very rich country, were really poor if you go back 200 years. They had just nothing, only some stuff for eating and a very simple shelter house. The energy demand was low, more or less wood. The United States had a long tradition of burning wood, even the steam trains, steam power trains used wood because wood was um, plentiful. Um, there are so huge forests 
uh, they could cut them and so it needed some time until they changed from wood to gold. Now you see that the reality this uh, lines are tricky. During wartime the typical situation is that your, your GDP goes down and then it goes up again after the war and after the war the economy soars and goes up to new levels. In this case it has gone up in the GDP and it has gone up in the demand. And now the interesting thing, although people don't know that, United States since 1975 has a long-term trend to reduce energy use per GDP. That is very interesting. Why is it so interesting? Because we know that in history countries like the United States are the leader of the track and if they can manage it to reduce the energy impact others will follow and you see that for other countries like Japan more or less the same situation going up and then stabilizing no not actually precise but um, not as fast as it has grown in the beginning. Some countries are also very complex, like um, the United Kingdom. So what you see in was growing, and then you also have a long-term trend, a little bit going down per GDP, always per GDP, not for absolute numbers. And China is still at the beginning of that track. And so if you look into China, we can be sure that this line will follow in some way the line of the United States. But we are here at the beginning and we will see all that effects. Energy demand will grow, will get weaker, and then in some days they will reduce the energy demand per GDP. But we are at the very, very beginning of that long-term development. Other people ask for income. How much money do you earn if you have energy? We can also go through that. The long term trend is that the amount of megajoules you need to earn a dollar is, uh, compared to the GDP, um, has a long term trend of going down. So we have more and more production or processes in the market that don't need energy. That is often called a service society. And services usually don't eat up so much energy. No, okay, this was an overview of the um, different um, ways how it was the development was. And now we go into the in a picture. How is it today? And we look in this uh, situation into the German statistics. Um, by the German statistics, I had the best data available for 2015. Other countries have more or less similar situations, but you have to learn that German is a country with a very diverse in some way diverse production and have a lot of engineering products so we are not absolutely typical but I think we have some similarities with other countries like uh, China, Japan and in some ways with uh, the United States. Where does our energy go? So there first of all there's one energy eating industry and that's definitely chemical industry. As I already mentioned, to produce chemicals, you need energy. You have to use electricity to change the molecules, whatever you do, you oxidize, you have different processes. They are really energy intense. Also, um, you have to heat stuff, you have to cool stuff, you have to uh, mix stuff, and uh, all that eats energy. So if you have ever the chance to go to Ludwigshafen, um, there is a big chemical site 
they eat up the energy of, I think, two or three nuclear power stations. That's incredible for one site. So what's the next one? The next one is metals. Producing metal, steel, but also other types of metal, you need energy because to melt metal, you have to heat it. And that is a lot of energy to heat metal. I've been in, because one of my students was there in a production site for barrels, and it is impressive <laughs> what they are doing there. They heat all the metals multiple times and cool it down, and then it gets harder and harder, and you can use it for very high level equipment. For example, even for the Airbus A380, they very difficult parts of the jet engine are produced there and that is eats up a lot of energy so um what are other big things big players oil production oil production cooker cocos is not that often but oil is during for production process also eating energy so the funny thing is if you buy one liter of gasoline at the gas station you have brought also two kilowatt hours of energy it's not exactly the energy you, you buy because that's 10 kilowatt hours but there is a lot of energy inside or during the process going into the product because you have to separate the different types of oil and um, octane uh, levels and so on Another big player is paper. Why is paper so eating so much? If you produce paper, you have to, I don't know how you know the paper process, but what you do is you make the fibers, the cellulose fibers wet, and then you have to dry them again. This drying process is eating up a lot of energy. So that are the big players. There are some more, like uh, producing glass, the ceramics, there is rubber, there is electrical equipment, there are machines, and so on and so on. But they all have a small slice of this big um, demand. Um, one thing should be mentioned here that is food production, and that gives us another 7% food. Um, processing and whatever you do with the food before you put your pizza in your oven. Look over a long time, no, not so long time, it's about 20 years, and you see that the production, the energy demand for the different types of production is more or less constant. So Germany is in more or less a steady state. Um, there is a small growth in the mineral oil production. The reason is uh, people like to drive cars, and if they have more cars and drive more miles, then we have a little bit more demand in oil. That gives us here a surplus. Most of the other areas we just discussed are flat, so some are also going a little bit down. This um, is sometimes the reason that we have a higher efficiency during the production process. Now um, we can look into different slices of um, business and we see for example in oil it is uh, changing going up and down. The demand for energy that has reasons but overall there is a long-term trend that if you ask how much energy you use for a defined amount of production that this energy is in the long-term trend going down now where are the big eaters? We have already seen some of them. I um, want to skip this slide a little bit. You see that 
there are some other areas we didn't talk about that was mining mining is also energy intensive because you have to break the rock and a lot of the rock is not containing ore so you break much more rock than you actually want to break but nature is in a way mix mixing all the stuff that you have to use a lot of energy for this mining and if you look in this list um, yeah we have already the big players seen um, now again in the question of uh, proto inland product uh, gdp the amount of energy a gigajoule per 1000 us dollar is going down but not in the same way in every country what we see here are different countries and first of all we look to germany and this is this red line and you see germany did a, have a good way from six down to four so within 25 years we reduced our energy demand per thousand us dollars um, production from six to four it's a reduction of about 30 percent other countries did much better look to china starting with 40 and now at a level of something like 17 or 18 that is more than half it's 60 percent reduction why is china so impressive the reason is in some way of course because they started so high at the beginning of their industrialization and modern industrial pro processing they were very inefficient they were the most inefficient country of all countries we look into but over time they have gone better than the soviet union they have gone done better than india and then they have crossed the line of africa and they have crossed the line of middle east so they are still a way above of germany but they are on the right track other areas in the world do not that well reduce their energy demand but it seems that in the long term all countries optimize that now we go in um, different product and the first product i want to introduce is aluminium aluminium is a really interesting metal so first of all it was a relative newly discovered in most of the metals you are you know like iron and gold and silver and whatever you know is well known to mankind for thousands of years that's not true for aluminium aluminium was first found um, in 1886 and that is not long ago um, and it was that time that it was an amazing expensive material and one of the first places that they built aluminium is just nearby Furtwangen um, it is in Schaffhausen if you go to the Swiss border at the Rhine there was the first production at the beginning of the 19th century um, for iron and then uh, they started to produce aluminium here the amazing thing is that it's still um, you know now at the place that the aluminium was produced is only a nice park but the water from the rainfall was the reason that this aluminium production started here because the rainfall was a very efficient source of energy from water power hydro power and so they started that that place of aluminium production 
actually um, I came from a f aluminium family in some way. My grandfather was working in a aluminium company and he was in the bookkeeping of this uh, aluminium company in Hüging in East Bavaria. And the um, company was set at this site in Tuging. You never heard that name, of course, um, because the Inn River, one of the largest Alp rivers, had a channel and was producing an awful lot of electricity. And so they put an aluminium mill nearby. Well, they built all the channel system for this aluminium mill because it was a cheap source of electricity and if you have cheap electricity, you can produce cheap aluminium. And why did we need so much aluminium in the beginning of the 19th, of our 20th century, or the first half of it? That is the airplane industry, because airplanes are built more or less from aluminium. And so the production started. How do they do that? Um, what you need in the so-called hull harrow process is you melt cellulite, and that happens in here. That's a big um, bath of molten cellulite. Uh, it contains aluminium, and now you contact through the electric bars here is the minus and as the minus you have a graphite cathode and the stuff is very hot it's above the temperature of <coughs> melting aluminium so in the range of a thousand degree celsius and then the molten aluminium is heavy and you have it directly above the graphite cathode because molten aluminium is electric conductive, it's no problem to bring the electricity inside here. And new aluminium is constantly produced at that part. On the other side, you produce a crust of the other material and you produce some carbon dioxide, by the way. So if you have a ton aluminium, you produce 12 tons of carbon. Dioxide. That should be mentioned. And sometimes people discuss about electric cars, for example, the Tesla car is more or less, the Tesla S is more or less aluminium. And so people say, okay, this electric car uses a lot of carbon. That is in some way true, but it's not the whole story because aluminium can be recycled in an amazing good way. So most of aluminium is not wasted. So chemically process is aluminium, adding free electrons and you get aluminium. The aluminium ion is going to aluminium. Then aluminium oxide. So first you have aluminium oxide, by the way, um, oxide, sometimes called. And you combine that with the carbon from here, the graphite. And then this produces carbon oxide and uh, finally you end up with carbon dioxide and that's the full chemical equation for that if you're in what you see here here comes the power in this is a 220 kilo ampere current that is a strong strong current and so you have to have this current because every electron here has to be brought in from the electricity company and a kiloampere is yeah, it's a thousand times more than you will have in your in your computer or whatever it's really a lot and you can optimize the process by optimizing the temperature the isolation and whatever and so over the years this process has gone better and better and it is now near to the theoretically optimum because you can't reduce the number of electrons here otherwise you don't get aluminum. so we can look into that how efficient the process is and we look here how much kilowatt hours you need to produce aluminum in the year 2000 it was uh, 15 
1500. And now the people came in and optimized and optimized. And finally, we're here with 1,300. Interestingly, this line is for China. China is a country that really has the best performance for the production of aluminium. That is really a significant thing. Other countries didn't so well. North America still uses exactly the same amount of energy to produce aluminium as it did 15 years before. And so the industry is not um, in a good situation because the cost, um, the price of um, electricity is more or less the same in all countries. And so uh, you reduce the efficiency of your company. So um, the effect of this that um, China can produce aluminium so cheap is that um, most of the aluminium is now coming from China. And it should be mentioned that considerable 46% of um, Aluminium is from recycling, as I already mentioned. You can easily, more or less easy, recycle them. If you have a look into the world map, so how much aluminium do we use? 64,000 metric tons. That's an awful lot. And it goes into your cans and uh, cars and all your aluminium equipment you find especially in airplanes and so on. Where is it produced? No, North America has 3 million, 3.7, West Europe 3.7. That is in the same range. South America a little bit less. And now look into this amazing number. China produces about 10 times more aluminium than North America or than all other countries together. So this is not so widely known because most of the people think aluminium is produced everywhere or not especially in China because we don't see produced in China on an aluminium product. But you can be sure that if you have something to aluminium, it is from China. Why do we have aluminium production in some other areas like Africa? Usually Africa doesn't have too much um, production. The reason is if you have a big river, maybe here for example, and you can put a hydro dam there and you have no one who needs the energy, the simple way is put an aluminium mill nearby and produce aluminium. You can sell the aluminium on the world market, but it's very hard to sell the electricity from this remote hydro dam to any other places. So what usually happens at the beginning, they start to produce aluminium, then more and more people drop in, and then the local demand for electricity is so high that you shut down your aluminium mill. Exactly that happened, by the way, at the place where I came from. There was an aluminium mill and that was shut it down because it needed too much electricity. Same true for Africa, Oceania, and some other areas. I don't think Middle East produce so much aluminium. The reason is they have plenty of oil and a lot of energy, and so they use it for aluminium production. Now, what type of energy do you use? As already mentioned, you prefer to use hydropower. And so in many cases, like in North America, all the energy for aluminium comes from hydropower, more or less, I think, from Canada, because they have a lot of hydropower in remote sites. Same is true in South America. They have big rivers and they produce aluminium. Same and true in Africa. 
But there's one exception, that's China. China is burning coal. This red is coal, of course, and some other areas also is coal. A lot of gigawatt hours of this earth are going to this aluminium production. I think about you one uh, two percent. So um, here we have the um, distribution, and as I told you already, China is the big aluminium production place. They use typically coal, and so today coal is the primary source for the energy that is used for producing aluminium in the former days it was more um, dominated by hydropower so here again the a number about the world energy at the very beginning of our lecture we had learned that the world uses 500 extra joule of energy every year and the aluminium production, if you do the numbers, is 3.6 exajoule, and that is around about 1%, a little bit less than 1% of our energy in the world is going into aluminium. Steel. Now, the world is a world of steel. And here you see steel, fresh steel. And where is this pouring? The hat is not far away from here. It is in Treeberg. There is a, the Danube um, Steel uh, Company, and they do some special steel, steel usage. <clears throat> so now look into the numbers of the steel production. Looking back 20 years, 25 years, there have been a lot of different players. Russia, China, United States, Europe and Asia. And they all have trickled along. But as I already mentioned, one country changed the habits and that is china china has an exploding demand for steel and so if you look into these numbers you see that although it at the beginning it was the last but one area of steel production then it passed north america in 2000 in 2002 it passed Europe, in 2003 it passed the rest of Asia, and today the steel production of China is higher than all the rest of the world. It is not perfect constant, but it is really, really more than all the others here is in more or less India and some other so it is completely dominated by China. How do we produce steel? Now producing steel is mm, an old well known technology. You use um, ferrite ore and you use coal. That are the two ingredients. If you don't have coal in the early times or middle age they used Wood charcoal. charcoal. Um, it is a little bit tricky because you need a high temperature to produce steel. Uh, you or iron. First of all, you produce iron. You need about one thousand five hundred and fifty de um, fifty degrees Celsius. So that is high. That's really hot, and Producing something that hot, you need a lot of energy. That's clear. Okay. Now, how do we go through the production? The first thing, there are a little bit different ways to do that, but we start with the standard production. We take coal and we add 
the so-called ferrum um, ore pellets into a um, furnace um, and, and we have to heat that very good. So we blast in oxygen, direct oxygen, that it's getting very, very hot. We add additional near the coal, some oil and coal and gas, whatever we have to make that so hot. So this is the area where the chemical reaction happens um, to bring from iron oxide to separate the oxide, add that oxide to the carbon and free the element ferrum, that is iron. And after some another step, we can produce steel. Steel is more or less iron with a little bit of carbon. Uh, that makes the uh, iron very hard and stiff. How to do this in detail? There has been an awful lot of engineering to optimize that process. And today we have some specialized process. More or less, we blow oxygen into this um, liquid steel and then we exactly find the level of carbon that should be there and then other stuff is added so there are different processes but we are not we don't want to be experts in production of steel we want to understand where the energy is going and the energy is going here because we ask for coal and we have to heat that with other energy sources. So today 89% are using this BF BOOF process and the input comes from coal, 7% comes from electricity, 3% from natural gas and 1% from other sources. So mainly coal. Coal is the dominant demand here, and that is, of course, producing the carbon dioxide. Um, they can be substituted by electricity. So, if we have enough electricity, we can run the process with less coal. But yes, we need cheap sources of electricity and natural gas. So, that is a way to substitute that. Then it also reduces the carbon imprint of steel. Now, the interesting thing is if you ask people how much energy do you know it know actually for production of its steel, it is not a simple answer. The point is because you have so many different inputs. For example, electricity, fuel, and so on, and all these sources are coming from different uh, primary sources. That makes the first count different, difficult. Then you have the different steps during the production process, and so finally you use um, in the U.S steel production and you use 2.1 exajoule in, in US. That is a big number. You remember our numbers at the beginning. That is about 2% of the, um, no, it is a uh, half percent of the global energy demand that's going alone into the production for the US steel. China, I'm quite sure they have similar numbers and so they have to, maybe if they are a little bit more efficient <laughs> as we have learned in aluminium, but they eat up also a lot of energy. Now here in this slide we have the <clears throat> number converted to the amount of energy per kilogram, kilowatt hours per ton of raw steel and so one ton has about 600 
Now we don't usually use this precise information, something about 700 kilowatt hours per ton of steel built in the US. So you can convert that to an arbitrary different ideas and you can ask um, what types of primary energy is coming in there. It is a tricky process as I already told you, but finally we end up with the amount of 670 kilowatt hours per steel electricity. And then we can go through that and look in other sources of energy if you want to convert the um, kilojoules or gigajoules per coal and other inputs. But that gives you an idea how much energy is going into the steel production. Global steel production is very high. It is 1,600 megatons. So every person in the world, if you break that down to persons, um, and we have about 8 billion inhabitants here, every person uses 200 kilogram of steel every year. So because we don't eat steel, the steel is going somewhere, it is going into construction. Most of that is going into construction like bridges and houses and cars and yeah, other things that use steel, but the construction industry is very strong, a very strong demand um, in steel. That is per person in the world, 200 kilograms. And this steel production needs this 200 gigajoule, or now we are used to this 32 exajoules, and we again compare that with this number, and we see that something about 8% of our global energy is going into steel production. Uh, a little bit less. It's six percent. No, let's let's say it's six percent. Um, six and uh, six point four, something like that. But um, the numbers, it gives you an idea that it is more than aluminium. Aluminium was about one percent, and this is about six. Does it change over the years? No, more or less. The world global demand on steel is not growing very fast but is in a high level and a little bit depending on the world economic situation because construction housing needs a lot of steel. If it's growing fast, then that's a sign that we have a lot of new housing and new constructions. So the next stuff that we usually don't associate too much with um, energy is paper and there is an interesting thing we all have these computers today and computers actually should substitute paper there's an old saying of a paperless office now we try hard and if we look over the years then there isn't too much change. There is a little bit of change if we look into the types of energy source, for example, oil demand is reduced in the steel production, in the paper production, because the oil price is too high, and other energy biomass is going up because it is easy to use biomass for paper production. Again, how much energy is that um, comparing to our well-known 500 exajoule per year? It is about 1.5% of the energy in the world energy demand. So paper is eating up another 1.5% of 
for energy. Chemical industry eats up also a lot of energy um, for very different processes, organic resins, synthetic fibers, bulk chemicals, and so on. Um, you can look into this from a view of a global demand of energy and then you see this fraction is going into energy intensive manufacture and from this energy manufacture we have the chemical part here so about four or four point nine percent of our energy is going into chemical production and so depending on what type of chemicals you look and on what type of um, uh, what country you look.